Good afternoon. Uh, it's a great pleasure to stand before you today to talk about my favorite uh, subject, which is forecasting volcanic eruptions using volcanic gases. Um, volcanic eruptions are serious business. This is not esoteric science. Uh, millions of people today live uh, with the risk of, uh, of volcanic eruptions. And in fact, our species was almost wiped out by a volcanic eruption 70,000 years ago. Um, before actually starting this, though, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Sandra Yupa and to Tobias Fischer, who have both been uh, fantastic mentors to me and helped me getting going in uh, Costa Rica. And I'd also like to acknowledge all the other people who have contributed to these efforts of um, forecasting volcanic eruptions and monitoring gases. And in particular, uh, I'd like to acknowledge the USGS, who've been very supportive, and the people at, at INGV. And I'd also like to acknowledge this man. This is Werner Gegenbach, and he was uh, a visionary in volcanic gases. Uh, he basically established most of what we know about volcanic degassing um, to a large extent. Uh, he invented the sampling method that, that became uh, most commonly used, and he was an extremely good thermodynamicist. He's also kind of crazy, as you can see. He's uh, rappelling into the crater of Erebus Volcano in Antarctica to get gas samples. Um, and in 1996, he published uh, a very important paper called The Chemical Composition of Volcanic Gases. And what he showed, uh, he wasn't the first one to do this, but he, he expressed it in a, in, a, in, a, in a very clear way, I think, uh, which is that as degassing of a melt progresses, which is essentially uh, a function of pressure, different gases partition into or resolve into the gas phase uh, at different points in the degassing process. Particularly CO2 partitions into the gas early, and sulfur, HCl, and fluorine partition very late. And so we can use this fact to uh, understand uh, where in this process of degassing a magma is, and we can relate that to uh, depth, for example. So back in the day, Gegenbach had to go into the crater to get a gas sample to look at this. But in 2007, I think this was a, a, a very important paper by Sandra Ayupa. Um, this was the first year of my PhD. I remember this coming out. And what he showed is that this multiple gas analyzer, this is an instrument that you can install at the crater, uh, and you can measure, oops, You can measure key gas ratios, such as the CO2-SO2 ratio. And uh, before this activity at Etna Volcano, for example, there's a spike in the CO2-SO2 ratio. Uh, and it goes crazy after that during this whole eruptive ep episode. And the interpretation of these data is that um, this CO2-rich gas, this precursor, is due to the injection of magma deep into the system. Later on. Uh, later on in the degassing process, we see that these, these gases over here are residual after they've really lost a lot of their CO2. Then along comes the Deep Carbon Observatory in 2009, and Eric Howry was uh, very fundamental in starting this decade program, which was the, the main aim was to quantify the amount of CO2 coming out of, volcano, of all the volcanoes globally. And so uh, he came to uh, this gas workshop in Kamchatka, and this is basically the birth of the, of the decade program. Now, 10 years later, we have multi-gas data from all of these volcanoes. Some of them have permanent stations, and these permanent stations, uh, some of them have been destroyed by volcanic eruptions. And in the process of collecting these continuous data, uh, in some instances, we saw more cases of a CO2 precursor. One example is from Villa Rica Volcano in Chile. Uh, it had a, 
a large eruption in 2015, and you can see here uh, a pretty clear uh, CO2 spike before the eruption. Another example is from Masaya Volcano in Nicaragua, where uh, we saw an increase in CO2, SO2, clear spike here right before the emergence of this lava lake. And this might not be considered an eruption because the magma wasn't launched out of the volcano, but you can see that it's a very active system, and the only reason why there wasn't an explosive eruption is because the, gal the, the gas can separate efficiently uh, from the melt. So the style of volcanic activity depends a lot on the viscosity of the melt and this process of whether the gas can separate from the melt or not. We've all seen this video along many times now, but uh, Turrialba volcano in Costa Rica has shown uh, a couple of uh, interesting spikes in CO2, SO2 related to uh, eruptions. But what's actually quite interesting, in addition, these are the same data showing CO2 total sulfur ratio before these eruptive episodes, is the sulfur story. And this ratio, H2S SO2, is also very interesting in terms of uh, looking at volcanic activity. And what we see at Turrialba is quite interesting because before this phase, there was significant H2S in the gas emissions. After this first eruption, er, eruptive pe period, the H2S SO2 ratio goes up. H2S is considered normally a hydrothermal gas. And then after the initiation of this eruptive period, the H2S SO2 ratio plummets. And this was interpreted as uh, the transition from more hydrothermal uh, eruptions, so phreatic eruptions, uh, to the trans transition to more magmatic eruptions. So the first magmat truly magmatic bombs that were erupted from the volcano occurred right here. Poas Volcano is another really good place to look at interactions between hydrothermal system and a magmatic system. It's a very wet volcano. Most of the volcanoes on, on Earth have hydrothermal systems. Uh, at Poas, this is a phreatic eruption occurring through this hyperacid hyper crater lake. So in addition to these phreatic eruptions, which are very common at Poas, uh, you know, in, in 2014 we had, we had hundreds of these events. Um, but in 2017, we had a phreatomagmatic eruption. These are, are, are larger, more explosive eruptions, and this one generated a column up to, up to four kilometers. These are the gas data from POAS between 2016 and present, and these lines here represent uh, the series of, of phreatomagmatic eruptions. And what's we see here is a spectacular decrease in CO2, SO2, right before the eruptions. And at the same time, we see a massive drop in H2S, SO2 ratio. The other thing that's shown on this plot is the presence of this lake. So before the eruption, we have, we have the, the acid crater lake. Then we have magma and heat streaming through the system, which vaporizes this lake. Uh, over here, and then in the, the following years, we've seen the reestablishment of this lake, followed by more eruptions, which dry it out, so it's an ephemeral, very dynamic system. Gegenbach loved to plot data like this, which is on triangular plot, looking at CO2, SO2, and H2S. And on, on this plot, a constant H2S, SO2 ratio is a line radiating from the CO2 apex. And what we can see is that prior to this eruption, the gas data fall on a very clear line over here at an H2S SO2 ratio around two. And this is attributed to the precipitation or the loss of elemental sulfur from the gas phase. On this plot, uh, S, uh, elemental sulfur plots right there. So, this is the reaction that's controlling this equilibrium between H2S and SO2. And what we proposed in this paper is that the precipitation of, of native sulfur from the gas actually formed a hydrothermal seal in the upper part of the volcanic conduit, and that this led to the accumulation of gases and energy below this hydrothermal seal. 
which eventually failed. And when that failing started occurring, the gas composition changed dramatically and migrated in this direction towards the SO2 apex in a matter of two weeks. At that point, the eruption happened and the multigas was destroyed, as happens all too frequently. And we had to revert to drone measurements to get any further data. So we have a few points there where we were flying the drone into the erupting volcano, basically, and collecting data. And we can see that these data plot close to the star, which is the composition that you would expect uh, from a shallow magmatic body that's already lost a significant amount of CO2 during prior emplacement was our interpretation of this. The 2018 data, 2018 to present, when this lake is forming and dissipating again, fall over a wide range between our magmatic gas composition and uh, this hydrothermal gas composition, which is in equilibrium with uh, elemental nat native sulfur. So how do we explain these data? Well, probably we're losing sulfuric acid uh, to the water phase as this lake forms and, and then dissipates again. So it seems like the volcano is trying to get back to this sealing phase. And if it does that, that's a dangerous situation. So this is all following Gegenbach. And the other thing that I would like to mention here is that, in fact, uh, this hydrothermal sulfuric acid, an alternative explanation for this whole, whole range is that going from here to here could be the vaporization of sulfuric acid due to the injection of heat without any necessarily magmatic component. I don't think that's the case because we have other data to support uh, magmatic eruption at that point, most obviously the, the actual eruption of the magma. But the point is here is that we can, this is not necessarily a un unique solution. Uh, we need something else to be able to come to these kind of types of conclusions, such as geophysical data. But it would be very nice to have sulfur isotope data or carbon isotope data uh, collected at the same time as these multigas data. I think this is a, a, an important direction for future workers to further understand you know, the sulfur dynamics in these systems, especially at hydrothermal and at hydrothermal systems. And remobilization of, of previously deposited sulfur, I think, is, a, is, is probably going on in, in, in many cases. The other thing that I'd like to mention is uh, that we can look at other gases as well. We can look for other precursors of, of volcanic eruptions. On this plot, we're looking at CO2, SO2 plus H2SO. All of that variation that I was showing you, uh, orders of magnitude variation at POAS, is all sitting right there in this corner. And if we look at other volcanic, volcanic systems with, high, with hydrothermal systems, for example, Turrialba, Turrialba reactivated in about 2009. It had its first eruption in 2011. But years before, there was a massive change in the CO2 to total sulfur ratio. And then we can also look at CO2 methane ratios. We've heard a lot about methane. And a lot of, in a lot of these hydrothermal systems, especially in, in at big volcanoes with uh, large calderas and well-developed geothermal systems, we have, um, we have significant amount of methane. And this ratio varies over orders of magnitude as well. So if we can figure out a way how to measure this ratio in real time, that would be fantastic, especially for looking at uh, you know, volcanoes like Rincón de la Vieja and Miravalles, where you, it's very difficult to actually put a multigas on the summit, which then gets exploded and, and you lose it. So it would be nice to be able to, to measure something like CO2 methane ratio uh, at flank springs. And I think these things are, are, are prime in, in going forward with this. So uh, finally, I'd like to you know, really thank uh, the National Science Foundation and uh, the National Academy of Sciences for uh, producing this uh, erupt report, which really provides a solid foundation for the volcanology community going forward in, um, in working to, to forecast and understand volcanic eruptions. So, you know, our challenges are that we need to keep these networks operational. We lose instruments. 
We need to expand. Uh, we need to identify new real-time precursors. Um, we need efficient integration with other data sets like geophysical data sets, hopefully in real time. Uh, and we need more research into to better understand these precursors. And uh, finally, we need more compositional measurements of eruptive gases to fully understand uh, these systems. Thank you. Thanks very much for a fantastic presentation. Do we have one quick question? Uh, so why does it appear to be, for many of these cases, that the precursory uh, gas signals a few weeks before the eruption, what's the significance of a few weeks? Uh, I, well, I, th I think that's probably, you know, what, what we're seeing there is are, are the processes happening in, in the upper conduit, so when these, when, when these conduits start opening, I think, in response to, to magma injection. But I don't see why. It's, it should always be, you know, a couple of weeks. And, and, and like we've seen, a lot of these gas compositional changes happen, happen even years before. So really what we're looking at spe specifically with, with, with multi-gas data are relatively short uh, precursors, relatively short time periods before eruptions. Okay, thank you very much.